I announced in uh, January that uh, come June I was going to be leaving uh, Beaver and looking at some opportunities over in the private sector. So I'll be leaving a, a school that I've run for 28 years and actually leaving a sector where I've spent virtually my entire uh, professional life. And while the school that I run uh, is also a $30 million business with 100 employees, uh, I've read about business, I've read about businesses, but I didn't go to business school. Um, I took an economics class in college, got a C. <laughs> I got a lot of Cs, uh, but that's a different talk. Uh, we're not gonna give that talk today. Uh, but at this time, I've been thinking a little bit about what my leadership style is, what leadership is about, and wondering if that's gonna be such a big transition uh, to my next uh, chapter in life. Jim Collins is a business writer and best known for his book, Good to Great Business, and writes about businesses that get from good to great, how they get there, why they get there, and also a bit about businesses that don't uh, get from good to great. And he wrote a, um, a pamphlet a couple of years ago called Good to Great in the Social Sector. It was at a time when people were really leaning on social sector organizations to run themselves like businesses. You've got to run yourself like a business. And, Co and Collins correctly points out that most businesses aren't very good, and they certainly aren't very well run. That's not the idea. That's not the question. What all sectors have in common is, successful sec uh, uh, businesses have in common is that we have a vision, we have a purpose, we have a passion, and it's all about how we execute that vision while adhering to our purpose. A number of years ago, we, were, we had a building project, and uh, we had a landscape architect, uh, and she was building, we were working on our landscaping, and she was building this path that was going to go from an exit out to the parking lot. And it was a beautiful path that she had envisioned. It was gorgeous. It wound all over the place, and there were plantings everywhere, uh, and it really sort of elevated the, the look of the building, and she was feeling great about it. And I was looking at it, and I was talking to her, and I said, you know that when people come out of that door, they're going to the parking lot over there, and the path goes over there. And she said, well, it's a beautiful path. You know, it's, this is my vision, really. This is my vision for the path. And I said, yeah, but they're not going over there. They're going over there. She kept pushing. This is my vision. This is my vision. And I said, do you see that muddy path right there? And she said, yes, yeah. pave it. That's where they're going. Uh, and that's all about knowing your customer. You would think that that's easy. Everybody knows who the customer is, but people shockingly don't know who their customers are. K-16 education is terrible at this, and especially higher education. Higher education has no idea who the customer is. The customer is the student. They wouldn't know that. The customer is the student. Uh, there's one really great exception that I know of. There are a couple, I'm sure, but Southern New Hampshire University has a campus up in New Hampshire, and they have 125,000 students uh, worldwide. And that school knows that their customer is the 35-year-old single mother in St. Louis who's working a full-time job and has to find a way to access higher education to get a degree and get herself ahead. And they are focused 24-7 on making sure this is possible for that, uh, for that single woman, uh, single mother in St. Louis. Uh, I know a, a startup company uh, that was enormously popular. They got off to a great start. They were making really ingenious products for a very targeted customer. And they got really wrapped up in the popularity. And they started making more products and more products and more products and losing focus of who their customer was. And things totally unraveled from that point on. Talk about purpose and passion. Uh, Hewlett Packard is uh, sort of the symbolic founder of Silicon Valley. Uh, the company was founded in the 30s. And it was founded in a garage in Palo Alto. And they have this uh, manifesto about uh, what they call the rules of the garage. And this is great. Believe you can change the world. No politics, no bureaucracy. The customer defines a job well done. Radical ideas are not bad ideas. Make a contribution every day. If it doesn't contribute, it doesn't leave the garage. Believe that we can do anything. And this brings me to vision and strategy. People like to talk about uh, mission statements and value statements and vision statements, and then they go off and they have a three-day off-site to talk about missions and values, and they come back with all these things. We're not going to do that. Uh, we've got to go home tonight. 
Stick with me, we'll stay with vision, okay? Don't ask me about mission or values. Uh, we'll stay with vision. And strategy is very different from, uh, from vision. Uh, who knows about IDEO? Okay, what's IDEO? What is it? Design the Design Thinking Company. That's not their vision. That's their strategy, right? Uh, their vision is to solve big ideas. Their uh, pr a purpose is to help others succeed, is to embrace ambiguity, is to be optimistic. Their strategy is design thinking. Design thinking makes the company work. Uh, it's, not, it's not the vision, and we conflate that all the time. Strategy needs to change. If you're a, a dynamic organization, when you hire people, don't, re, don't hire the person that, you, that just left. Uh, hire a new person. Hire a person who's going to move that vision forward. Uh, we have at, at Beaver, we have something we call the new basics. It, it, it create a problem solving, collaboration, iteration, visual communication. That's not our vision. That's our strategy. Our vision is to uh, expand the nature of school for children. If our new basics are the same two years from now, we're not doing our job. Strategy without vision creates uh, mediocrity. That startup I talked about, they didn't go from good to great. They went from very good to mediocre. K-16 to education uh, embraces the same strategies we've been using for 100 years and K-16 to education embraces mediocrity as a result. Let's talk about a shared mindset. Back uh, at the early days of the uh, first dot-com boom, Jim Barksdale, who was the CEO of Netscape, was asked you know, how he uh, uh, knows what to focus on in a world that's changing so rapidly. And it was a TV interview, and Barksdale uh, thought for a moment, and he came up with this sort of Chauncey Gardner wisdom uh, with his response. His response was, the main thing is to be sure that the main thing is the main thing. That is Chauncey Gardner. Uh, and to do that, you do need to have uh, a shared mindset. At Beaver, we have our own rules of the garage, uh, our own mindset. For us, this is the way we work. If we have a good idea, we launch it. We get it out there right away, we test it, we refine it, we do it on the run. We believe in making mistakes. If you're gonna have big ideas and a big vision, you're gonna make mistakes. Believe in thinking both and, not either or. Think differently. And this is how we operate, this is our, our mindset, uh, and this is how we know how to focus on the right thing. A Couple of personal things about leadership. I do believe leadership is about having a point of view. And in doing that, uh, you need to be fearless, and you need to be optimistic. Uh, a number of years ago, about 12 years ago, uh, we launched our one-on-one -on -one laptop initiative. And every student in the school was gonna have a laptop. And teachers were excited about it. Students were excited about it. Parents freaked out. Big time. Parents freaked out. I don't get it. What are our kids doing? There's a screen in the room. I don't understand where are the books. Uh, this is a disaster. Uh, we, held, we, held, uh, we, we held our ground, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't compromise because we knew it was the right thing to do for the customer, the student. Uh, optimism, also very important. Uh, if you have a, 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 an organization with vision with pers uh, and with purpose, uh, you have to, everybody in that organization has to be optimistic about the future of that organization. Uh, you can certainly, uh, embrace a divergent points of view that fit in with the vision, but you can't tolerate negativity. Negativity is contagious, and guess what? So is optimism contagious. Uh, I tell our school every day that we're the best school in Boston. We are the best school in Boston, and we believe it because it's true. All right, anybody who knows me knows I hate surveys. I hate surveys. Surveys come up with uncontextualized information that we apply with disastrous results. Uh, and surveys are also comical. Uh, when's the last time you got out of a lift? We won't mention the other people. You got out of a lift and you know, you're grabbing your luggage or whatever it is and you get this thing, you know, rate your driver, right? And uh, guess what? Everybody gives the driver a five. Everybody gives the driver a five. If you give the driver a four, they text you right away and they say, what happened? You only got a four, and then you're, you're, you feel bad, and you say, well, the, the, the ride was going really well, and then I looked up when we were going the wrong way in the pike, and so I said I should give him a four and not a five, you know, I didn't want, but, I, but I don't want to get him fired. Uh, averages, uh, 
are also something that people get obsessed with and uh, also give us misinformation. There's a guy, Todd Rose, wrote a book called uh, End of Average. It's a terrific book. And he talks about how averages are misapplied in so many different ways and in very serious ways. Uh, years ago, uh, with cancer research, uh, people were focused on identifying the average cancer and then treating the average cancer. And we find out there was no such thing as an average cancer. And now we have targeted uh, treatments uh, for cancer. Education is, is really terrible about looking at averages. Uh, standardized testing is based on the average student. Textbooks are based on the average student. It's almost like we're trying to create the average student, but there's no such thing as an average student. So uh, average is a statistic that means absolutely nothing. Another thing ab about leadership is the, the capacity to act uh, quickly and methodically at the same time. I played hockey in, in high school and for a minute in college. A, that's a goalie. I was a goalie, all right? And when I got to college, uh, it wasn't that they were firing the puck 110 miles an hour instead of 100 miles an hour. Uh, it was they were going so fast. Uh, they were going so fast. I couldn't believe how fast the game was. And, you know, when you we, we talk about athletes going up to the next level, they say they begin to succeed when they're able to slow the game down. Uh, that didn't work for me. As you, can, uh, you don't see hockey in my resume anywhere. It did not work for me. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, once uh, in a very ungoalie like way, uh, and this was a puck coming at me uh, with a guy who ended up in the, NHL, in the NHL at about 120 miles an hour, and it went through the, actually right through the net and broke the glass behind me. My reaction, thank God that didn't hit me. <laughs> Wrong reaction, but uh, in business, yeah, things are moving very quickly, very quickly, and you have to slow down your internal clock uh, and make decisions methodically w while appearing to move quickly at the same time. Empathy and humility. There's a lot of writing about leadership and humility. Empathy is really about knowing that customer, knowing that student, knowing that pa uh, patient, uh, knowing, really knowing who they are. Uh, humility, also important. If you're uh, uh, leading a dynamic uh, organization, uh, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna make a lot of mistakes. Leaders need to own their mistakes. They need to spread around the credit for uh, success, but they need to admit to the, uh, own their mistakes because, and I'll get to this in a minute, it's not about you. So now, something a little counterintuitive. If you are running an organization that has a dynamic vision, that has a real purpose, that you're really passionate about, democratic decision-making might not always work. Uh, democratic decision-making may not always work. If you really care about the outcome, if you have that point of view, all decision-making can't be democratic. I was asked uh, a number of years ago by someone about to describe my uh, uh, leadership style. I'm looking at her. And uh, I said, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but not really. I said, actually, uh, I run a highly participatory dictatorship. Uh, highly participatory dictatorship. So yeah, we listen to divergent viewpoints within the context of your vision. Uh, you get input, but in the end, be ambitious, make a decision. Uh, it's okay. I want to finish with uh, uh, Jim Collins again. Uh, Jim Collins wrote a, uh, a piece for Harvard Business Review, and actually, coincidentally, Harvard is, is one of the business schools I didn't go to. Uh, <laughs> So uh, he wrote a piece for the uh, uh, Harvard Business Review about different levels of leadership, and he ranked them one through five, and I'm just gonna look at, at four and five. Level four leaders are, are leaders who are charismatic, they're dynamic, they're ambitious, and the organization is wrapped up in the cult of that leader's personality. The organization succeeds when the leader leaves, the organization flounders because they have to reinvent their identity. And sometimes that takes a lot of time and sometimes it just doesn't work at all. Level five leaders are ambitious for the organization. Their goal is to build something that's, that's sustainable. And after a while, if they do their job, the organization takes on a life of its own. And when they leave, nobody notices and everything's fine. Uh, I think all leaders need to aspire to be level five leaders. And I'm gonna finish with a personal story that maybe, I hope, uh, encapsulates uh, this, uh, what a level five leader is, what empathy is, and, and, and who the customer is. Long time ago, my oldest daughter, uh, 
was starting to attend Beaver. I hadn't experienced this before. And one day, uh, she came home, and she was complaining about everything. Her teachers, her classes, the lunch, the soccer practice, everything was wrong, everything. And, uh, and I was taking it personally, and I was getting defensive, and uh, it, was, it, was just, it was driving me nuts. And so, you know, she left the table, and my wife uh, looked at me with one of those, you know, really? How many people have seen the really look? <laughs> Mostly men, okay. Uh, she looked at me and said, really? And she said, you know, it's not your school. It's her school. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>